here we are. We're jumping into a brand new series called Cancelled about Jesus' alternative to our polarized world. And I don't know if you're like me, but you kind of arrive today. And on one hand, you've got some excitement. On the other hand, maybe you're a little bit nervous. Maybe you came to see if the pastor would get canceled in the midst of the canceled message. But I really do believe that God has something for you here this morning. And I arrive with some excitement and I arrive with some trepidation. Now, There are a couple of things that I want to share with you right off the top. The first is you want to stay with us for all three weeks of this series. I think it's really going to speak to you most when you do that. And you might not agree with everything I have to say, but it's an important conversation for you to be having. And we're going to talk about why that is this morning. Now, you've probably heard the term canceled or call out culture or cancel culture at some point over the last months, over the last years. And it's really an interesting topic that people don't like to talk about because it means different things to different people. So people are a little bit nervous about it. Now, the, it is true that it means different things to different people. I would say cancel culture is actually a suitcase term. Cancel culture is a suitcase term. It's a term that means different things uh, to different people for different reasons. I'll explain that to you. First of all, when I looked this up in dictionaries, I looked at five dictionaries, what cancel culture means, they all had different definitions. Every single one had a different definition. So, so we can see even dictionaries can't define it accurately. Second of all, when it comes to cancel culture being a suitcase term, it's a suitcase term not just because different definitions, but because we all bring our baggage. We all bring our filter, right? I'm a white guy with white hair, and I'm going to see cancel culture a certain way. And you're going to see it based on your age, your demographic, where you're coming from. You're going to see it in a different way, your experiences. And so cancel culture is this kind of suitcase term that means different things to different people. That's part of what makes it challenging. Now today, I want to show you a definition of cancel culture that I thought was kind of the clearest out of dictionary.com. And the reason we want to dig down on this is because cancel culture isn't just something out there. It's now starting to become something fairly personal. You know, I, I see people who will say, well, I unfollowed them on Facebook. I canceled them on Facebook. Or uh, my friend, I just disagree with them, so I canceled them, which means I ghosted them. I disappeared on them. I, I canceled them. I just, I disagree, and so I can't engage. And so we want to talk about it, and I want to start with this definition on cancel culture. It says this, cancel culture refers to the popular practice of withdrawing support for or canceling. Some people would use the word boycotting public figures and companies after they've done or said something considered objectionable or offensive. So you have a person, a celebrity, a company who says something you think is morally wrong, you think they've done something morally wrong or objectionable, and you're saying, hey, I, I want to do something about it. And so you say, let's boycott them. Let's cancel them. Let, let's, let's jump on them online and, and let everybody know what they're doing. And it does say this, cancel culture is generally discussed as being performed on social media in the form of group shaming. So um, it really happens on social media the most. That's been the most recent, but now you're seeing it in people's individual lives. And there's a, a part of it that's shaming a group, shaming a person, shaming a company because of what they're doing. Now, cancel culture or call out culture uh, is problematic for a couple of reasons. One of them is the cancel culture, not just as a suitcase term, but there's different aspects to it. Canceling someone can mean speaking truth to injustice. Canceling someone can mean speaking truth to injustice. There, there's a part of cancel culture that's saying, hey, something's wrong, something isn't true, and I need to stand up for the truth. I need to stand up for what's right. Canceling someone is speaking truth to injustice. And a part of that is a good thing. I really do believe there's part of us that, is, that we're made in the image of God, and there's part of us that wants to speak truth to injustice, that, that we want to stand up for what's right. We want to stand up for what's true, and, and that's a good thing. We want to stand against injustice. We want to stand for those who are disenfranchised. We want to stand up for those who've got challenges in their life. Hard times have fallen on them. We want to speak truth to injustice when we cancel someone. There's a part of that that's a good thing. But then canceling someone can also mean shaming someone. Shaming someone while comparing their worst moment to your best. 
shaming someone and saying, hey, I, I'm going to look at what they're doing. I'm going to look at them in the midst of their worst moment and compare it to the fact that I'm just not like that, that, that I would never do that. Just recently here locally in Alliston, uh, there were a couple of women who were PSWs who were at a grocery store. And they took a video of themselves not wearing masks. And what they were doing is they were uh, talking about how frustrated they were with COVID and how they were done with it and a number of other things. And it was clear that um, they're picking up chips and beer. It was clear that they were venting a little bit. And people got incredibly upset when they saw this video online and frustrated with these two women. And what happened was people were calling for their jobs. They should, be, they should be fired. They should lose their jobs. Their boss needs to do something about this. And I actually saw a news report where they're interviewing people in a car, like as people were driving by, like, what do you think should happen? What do you think should happen? And some of these people didn't really know a lot about the situation, right? They're just making a snap judgment. And when I look at that, well, you or I, maybe we would find ourselves frustrated with their behavior, well, we might say that they've done something wrong. At the same time, when I look back, when I was their age, or maybe when I was 19 or 20 or 25 personally, I did some things that I'm not proud of, that, that I've made some mistakes. And uh, back then, I didn't have a phone to post them all online. And when you think of people in our culture, a generation that's grown up with phones, no wonder they experience so much anxiety not knowing at any given moment will someone shame me online for what I post? Will people like it? Will people dislike it? Will people shame me? Will people make fun of me? I mean, there's so much anxiety around it. And these two women, probably A shouldn't have done this and B shouldn't have posted online, but they did. But am I comparing their worst moment to my best? Because I've made my own mistakes. One way to look at it is this way. One person's cancel culture is another person's holding accountable. One person's cancel culture is another person's holding accountable. And you might say, well, I'm just, I'm holding this person accountable, but someone else is going to see it differently. That, th this kind of explains the tension that we're in the midst of here in a polarized, increasingly polarized world. Now, I think we also need to acknowledge something about the Western church. Churches were one of the earliest to use their platform to cancel people. Churches were one of the earliest, one of the first, the original cancel culture, some would say. Back in the 90s, you had a group of churches that got together and said all the Christians need to boycott Disney because they didn't like some of their practices. And then J.K. Rowling came out with the first Harry Potter and had goblins and witches in it. And they said, you know, oh, everybody now needs to boycott and cancel Harry Potter. I'm, I'm sure they had good intentions. Churches have come out and said, hey, we need to cancel the Beatles. I mean, Yellow Submarine, Hey Jude, like we shouldn't listen to any of those songs, right? The churches came out and said, we need to boycott them. In fact, in the 90s, um, there was so much of this. The church was known so much for what it was against that um, SNL, Saturday Night Live, came out, came out with a character called the church lady, Enid Strict. And Enid Strict, who was the church lady, basically would share about how she was against this band, this music, this celebrity because of how they dressed, how this person dressed, this politician. Enid Strict was basically going on and on and on in every episode about what she was against, who needed to be canceled, who needed to be boycotted. It was really SNL's desire to put a mirror up to the church community at how funny this was to everybody else around them. We also need to recognize that the church has notoriously got this wrong. That the church at large has spent a lot of time holding the world accountable, but hasn't always held itself accountable. That we've all seen church leaders who've had moral failures, who've made terrible, dishonest decisions around money. We've seen church leaders who've made grave mistakes. And these are mistakes that you would find outside the church, but the church should be held to a higher standard. We haven't always got this right. So Jeff, why are we talking about this? Why is this important to you and why is this important to me? I'm going to tell you why this is important to you, not just now, not just today, but next week and next month and next year and the year after that. This is why this is critically, critically important for you. 
your access to power, influence, and judgment is faster than your access to knowledge and relationship. This is something that's shifted in our culture. Let me say it again. Your access to power, influence, and judgment is faster than your access to knowledge and relationship. You have the ability today to judge someone and to let everybody know like that. You can put it out on social media. You can text it to a friend. You can WhatsApp it to a group of people. I mean, anybody can tell you anything. You can make an immediate judgment and let the whole world know. You can rally all the people you know around it. You can post any link, any article, and it's faster than actually your knowledge and relationship. It takes time to actually learn the nuances of an issue. It takes time to actually learn the nuances of a problem. And that, that's slower. So we end up judging and not pursuing knowledge. We, we don't actually know the people or we haven't had the time to build a relationship, but we judge quickly online. I grew up in a small town and uh, pre-internet when I was a kid, if somebody did something in town, what would happen would be the gossip mill might go around for a few days and then you would hear about it and you actually knew the person and you'd kind of come to knowledge about what actually happened over the course of time. That doesn't happen anymore. That it's online and it's posted and there's power, influence, and judgment happening in a snap. But knowledge and relationship take time. Now, I want to share with you about one example of this. Emmanuel Cafferty is a gentleman who lives in California. And he was working for an electric and gas company. And he was driving one day in a company truck, logo on the side, and he had the window down. And he was driving with his arm in the window. And he didn't realize, but he was making like an OK sign, but upside down, kind of just, just the way his hand lay. And what he didn't know, and I didn't know, was that an up, upside down OK sign is a sign that white supremacists to show one another, used to show one another that they're in favor of white supremacy. So somebody snapped his picture, making this hand gesture in front of the company logo, he, him being totally unaware of what, what, what that even meant. And that got posted online. Somebody pointed out what it meant. And he was canceled. Within two hours, the company came and they took their truck back. With a matter of a couple of days, he lost his job. Never able to get it back. And Emmanuel Cafferty, whose mom is Latina, was trying to argue to people that there's no way he could be a white supremacist, that he didn't even know what this meant, this symbol. And the gentleman who took the photo today says he regrets taking it and he regrets posting it, but the damage is already done. Influence, power, judgment so much faster than knowledge and relationship. That's why we have to pay attention to this. Because even if you don't believe in Jesus, I don't know how you ended up here, but it doesn't matter who you are, your life is a platform. Your life is a platform to influence from someone, to influence your family, to influence your friends, to influence online, to influence at work. Your life is a platform. You can't get away from that. And in fact, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's, there's a higher standard here. Your life is a ministry. You're a representative of Christ in the world to the people around you. And the question I want to ask today is, what does it mean to use your voice? Because there's lots of people out there who want to teach you how to build an audience, how to get followers, how to get subscribers, how to win friends and influence people. There's lots of people who want to teach you how to do that. But what does it mean to actually use your voice in the midst of an increasingly polarized world? How did Jesus do it? That's what we want to look at through this series. How did Jesus do it? How did Jesus handle a polarized world where he could legitimately cancel anyone? Jesus, perfect, God's own son, comes to earth, lives a perfect life, can see the sin, the past, the internal sin, the thoughts, the emotions in every single person. I mean, he could cancel anyone. He knew all their secret thoughts. How, how did he live in the midst of this polarized world? How polarized was his world? Well, you had the Roman government who'd taken over the Jews you got the Roman government running things, so you've got this political polarization. 
And then the Jews had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, religious groups that were vying for power. Then you had the Zealots, Jewish people who were saying we should overthrow the Roman government. You had the Essenes who were living outside in the desert, basically trying to distance themselves. And in the midst of all of this drama and all of this tension, Jesus arrives and says, yeah, you know that Messiah, that son of God you've been waiting for? I'm here. How how did he handle his polarized world? That's what we want to look at throughout this series. And I want to show you today in John, in the book of John, what John writes about Jesus' arrival on earth. And it gives us an incredible picture of how he handled his polarized world, how he handled his influence. So this is what it says in John 1, 9 to 14. It says this, The true light, that's Jesus, that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. Jesus was coming to earth. It says, And though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. Although he's the son of God, the creator of the earth, humanity didn't recognize him. He came down to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. In fact, they crucified him. Jesus came down as a Jewish man, but his own did not receive him. Humanity crucified him. It says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That those who believed in him, who followed him, were reborn as children of God spiritually. Children children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And it says this, the Word, capital W, really before time on earth ever began. The Word became flesh. God came with skin on and made his dwelling among us. In Jesus, John says. He says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Then get this, full of grace and truth. Jesus wasn't 50% grace and 50% truth. He wasn't 60% truth and 40% grace. He was 100% grace and 100% truth at the very same time. Now, you probably lean one way or the other. You've got grace people and you've got truth people. Now, you can put in the chat today whether you're a grace person or a truth person. You've got grace people, you've got truth people. Now, truth people look at grace people and they see them as soft, right? I'm a truth person, so I'll, I'll admit it. Sometimes they see them as soft. They might maybe see them as weak. They maybe see grace people as people who don't really stand up for things or people who don't speak their mind or not persuasive. And grace people on their worst days look at truth people and think, man, they're so harsh. They're so direct. They lack emotional intelligence. Why why do they always have to say what they're thinking all the time? You've got grace people. You've got truth people. But Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. So what does that look like to be full of grace and full of truth? Well, that's what we're going to look at for the rest of our time. We're going to look at truth without grace, the extreme, grace without truth, And how Jesus looked like both at the same time. Now, what does truth without grace look like? Well, truth without grace looks self-righteous. Truth without grace looks self-righteous. It's, I'm always right, you're wrong. It's comparing your worst moment to my best. it's, It's, I'm always right, I need everybody to know, and I'm going to judge you without judging myself. You know people who've been in, in spaces like this mentally. You've worked with them, maybe you live with them. Andy Stanley says this, the self-righteous are rarely self-aware. The self-righteous are rarely self-aware. They're rarely not aware of how people see them, and they're rarely aware of what's going on in their own life. Truth without grace, the extreme of that is fearful. It's a a fear that if I don't say something, if I don't do something, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? I have to say the truth. If I don't say it, who will say it? Truth without grace is hurtful. And and it's hurtful in two ways. It's it's hurtful in that it can be cutting to say truth without grace. I mean, I've done that. If you're a truth person, you've done that. It can hurt other people, your tone. But also, when you speak truth without grace, often it's because someone has done the same to you. 
It's the way your dad spoke to you. It's the way your mom spoke to you. It's the way an aunt spoke to you. All truth and no grace. And now you're living out the same story. E- even on a micro level. You have a bad day at work, you take it out on the kids. You have a bad day at home, you take it out on an employee. Truth without grace can be hurtful. Truth without grace is hypocritical. There's a hypocrisy to, I'm going to judge you, but I'm not going to judge myself. I'm going to tell you, but I'm not going to tell myself. And truth is really without grace. is about power and control. Me wanting to control the situation, control the narrative, control what's happening. It's, I'm tough on us truth people. Now, truth without grace, what it looks like is it creates a life where we stand for everyone and stand with no one. If we're all truth and no grace, we're standing up for what's right, but at the end of the day, we're alienating the people around us. We continue to say what we think is true, but we're not really having a conversation with the people around us. Our posture of learning is low. Um, Adam Grant wrote a book called Think Again, and is, I highly recommend it. It's about the kind of tagline in the book is the power of knowing what you don't know. Because truth people, we feel like we know. And he says this, he said, we all have blind spots in our knowledge and opinions. And he says, the bad news is that they can leave us blind to our blindness. Leave us blind to our blindness. We get so caught up in our, in our sense of rightness and righteousness that we're missing out what we're blind to, which gives us false confidence in our judgment and prevents us from rethinking. All truth and no grace is dangerous. Now, truth people, you're pretty bruised up and you're like, Jeff, what about the grace people? Okay, let's talk about grace without truth. Here's the thing. Grace without truth looks the same as truth without grace. Grace without truth is self-righteous. It's, you know, I'm not one of those hurtful people. I have emotional intelligence. I really care about people. You know, those truth people, they don't care about people, but I do. You know, I, I put the person before the position. And, and it, there's a self-righteousness that can creep in. That I'm better than they are. Grace without, without truth is fearful. I don't want to speak the truth because I, I know what I want to say, but I don't know what's going to happen. And so I'm afraid. Grace, grace without truth can be hurtful. I'm telling my friend I love them, but not enough to tell them the truth. Grace without truth can be hypocritical. Grace without truth can be hypocritical saying how much you care about the person, but in the end, not really caring enough to tell them. Grace without truth is about power and control. It's about, I I don't want to say the truth. I don't want to say what's true because I don't know what's going to happen on the other side. I want to control it by just keeping everybody happy. Grace without truth, it, it creates a life where we stand with everyone. We love everyone, but we stand for no one because we don't speak what we know is true. And what happens with truth and grace is you get these varying opinions on either side. And Thomas Aquinas, uh, he said this about opinions. He said, if we're going to do this, we must love them both, those whose opinions we share and those whose opinions we we reject. That's a bit of his description of truth and grace. For both have labored in the search for truth and both have helped us in finding it. Even he was trying to figure this out. How do you see both sides of opinions? How do you have grace and truth? Well, how did Jesus do it? How did Jesus hold grace and truth 100% at the same time? What you have to look at is you have to start with this. Who was Jesus most interested in canceling? I mean, the Son of God who was perfect, who had the right to cancel anyone, all of the sinful people around him, all of the hypocritical people, all the people who who he could see their thoughts, he could see their desires, he could see all the things they'd done wrong, he knew their history as the Son of God. Who was he most interested in canceling? How did he approach this? This is what Paul writes. He says this, You were dead because of your sins, you and I. Because your sinful nature was not yet 
cut away. We're separated from God because of our sin. He says we were dead because of our sin. But then God, he says, made you alive with Christ. How did God make us alive with Christ? He says this. This is how. For he forgave all our sins. How did he forgive our sins? How, how did he forgive all the things we've done wrong? How did he forgive the, these sins that were the chasm between us and God? He says, well, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Jesus canceled our sin on the cross. In the moment Jesus could have canceled anyone in a time when humanity, and even to today, humanity deserves to be canceled for their sin. Instead, he chose to cancel your sin. He could have canceled anyone, but instead, he chose to cancel your sin on the cross. He said, I want to close that gap between you and God, that gap of sin, and I'm going to die on the cross to do that. I'm going to make that relationship with God possible. That's what makes the cross so scandalous that we deserved truth, but he met truth with grace. Jesus on that cross was 100% truth and 100% grace at the very same time. If you want to know what it is in a moment to be 100% grace and 100% truth, just think of Jesus on the cross dying for the truth of our sins with the grace of his sacrifice. What does grace with truth look like? It looks like accountability. Jesus knew that we needed to be accountable for our sins. In fact, he had the integrity to say, hey, they need to be accounted for and I'm going to pay for them. And grace with truth comes with that. It comes with conversations where we can hold people accountable with love, but also hold ourselves accountable with integrity. We just don't hold them accountable that we hold ourselves accountable. That's, That's what truth and grace look like. Accountability and integrity with a loving heart. It looks like forgiveness. That's what it was on the cross. And that's what it is for you and for me to come to someone and say, I know you're sorry and I forgive you. I know you made a mess and I forgive you. I know you hurt me and I forgive you. I know you're sorry and I forgive you. Grace with truth on the cross lived out in our lives is forgiveness, it's accountability, it's integrity, it's redemption. Jesus redeeming our lives on the cross, the God of second chances saying, I'm going to give you another chance and another chance to redeem your life. And the chance at redemption is the kind of platform we should have, is the kind of influence we should have on the people around us, giving people a chance to redeem themselves. Grace with truth is confidence in Jesus. I don't need to control all the outcomes because at the end of the day, I can trust in him because of what he did on the cross. Grace with truth, accountability, integrity, forgiveness, redemption, confidence in Jesus. This is the kind of influence we want to have. This is the kind of ministry we want to have. This is the kind of platform we want to have. 100% truth and 100% grace because truth is most powerful when it's filled with grace. Isn't it? You want to hear truth from people when it's filled with grace. I mean, that's when you're most willing to be impacted, to listen. And grace is most powerful when it's filled with truth. That the people who love you, you want them to tell you the truth. This week, this is what I want to ask you to do. If you're a truth person, I want you to step into grace. When you speak to people, when you speak to your spouse, when you speak to your kids, when you speak to your friends, when you speak to your employer, speak the truth with grace. And if you're a grace person, step into truth. When you know you should say something, when you know you should stand up, you know, when you know what's right and and you're afraid to speak, Take a step into truth. Some of you know that um, back in June, Danelle Sewell, who's on our staff, and I had a conversation about racism. And Danelle and I have continued that conversation over the last weeks, an opportunity for us to learn together 
him where I'm coming from and me to learn what it is to be a black man and a leader in our church and our community and of our students. And it's been an incredible conversation that's allowed me to continue to grow. And Danelle has come with both grace and truth to me, a conversation where I can come and not feel like I'm going to be judged if I say the wrong thing and not feeling like I'm going to make a mistake and he's going to hold it against me forever. He comes with grace and truth. How are we able to have a conversation like that? Because no matter where we're coming from, the thing we have in common is a Savior who died on the cross full of grace and full of truth. And no matter what happens, we're clinging to that. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for our church. The kind of people who in our world use our ministry and our platforms, wherever they are and with whoever our audience is, to be people full of grace and full of truth. Let me pray. God, I come to you this morning. We thank you for the gift of your son, the image of 100% grace and 100% truth. Help us to live in light of that and give us the strength to do so. And we pray this in your name. Amen.